been talking about okay sorry about that okay uh any board committee reports no oh, oh yep show Oh my God. Um, the Community Relations Committee met last night. We got an update on district news from the superintendent, from Dr. Glass. We also got updates from some of the PTA council um, committees. So um, Angela Schultz, who is the chair of the Social Emotional Learning Committee, part of the PTA Council uh, series of committees that were launched newly this year um, gave us an update, talked about the kinds of meetings they had had and, and spoke about the April meeting, which will be very well timed. Stay tuned for that. We hope to announce it when we have the final details of the April meeting of the Social Emotional Learning Committee. They will be focusing on um, anxiety in parents during this year. And we also um, heard a little bit from the advocacy committee. Um, committee member Natalie Vero was there, spoke a little bit about the work that they're doing to um, continue to advocate heavily and um, vigorously to the state for continued aid for schools. So um, stay tuned for that. There will be more news for sure this month. March is a big month for budget in the state and for school budgets. Well, I'm part of the advocacy. We have a resolution uh, on the agenda tonight, the New York State Public Education Funding Resolution. So that's part of the advocacy piece as well. Okay. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to the superintendent for the superintendent's report. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share a screen here if it's okay with you. Got a couple items I think would be helpful to take a look at. Just to highlight a few of the things that have occurred over the last several weeks, um, two weeks actually. Last week we had five, virtu five virtual sessions uh, and a task force meeting yesterday to go over the um, plan to bring more students back for more in-person learning. Really probably about a thousand people logged in over the course of those five meetings, actually more than that. And it was at least um, two hours per meeting. So these were some significant uh, times. I appreciate the community's input and the time that they spent to try to understand the plan and ask really thoughtful questions. Um, also appreciate our, fa our faculty and staff who joined us for those meetings. One of those five meetings was uh, dedicated to, to that group specifically. Uh, as, as Dr. Smith mentioned, our community relations uh, meeting was last night, was very helpful, um, very productive. Our PTA advocacy committee, advocacy committee uh, met recently and has done some great work. And we'll talk more about that with our resolution a little bit later in the agenda. Excited about our sports teams doing really well. Our hockey is the number one seed in the playoffs tomorrow, our girls basketball is in the playoffs tomorrow for an away game. And our boys basketball team is here for a home playoff game tomorrow. And they are the potential number one seed. So we're, we're doing really well this season. We're in the midst, by the way, of two seasons right now. Uh, the seasons are only three, three weeks long and they're overlapping. So they're very short, uh, but we are in the middle of uh, two seasons right now. Um, uh, some really great opportunities and, and programs that have been put together in, you know, just to show the creativity and flexibility of so many of our, um, the groups that provide uh, our students with creative outlet and, and co-curricular activities. Our Players Club had a shorts and winter comedy uh, recently. It was just tremendous. And they played that virtually several times um, and different, had different showings of that. Then our um, East Chester High School Full Orchestra has put together the uh, virtual magic of Harry Potter production for the, the full orchestra. It's just ter terrific. And then Anthony Rich, one of our, our teachers uh, who teaches at Greenvale, uh, got a Tell Award that's for the, uh, teaching excellence in leadership um, and, and learning. And that was um, put out by the Lower Hudson um, Regional Information Center, affectionately called LRIC, 
And they uh, do this award every year for outstanding educational technology integrators. And Anthony does, uh, won that award, award this year. We're very proud of him, very deserving. I wanna spotlight and highlight uh, some of our operations and maintenance team who keep our building buildings uh, clean, and not only clean, but sterilized and sanitized. And I also wanna recognize um, our, our communications coordinator, Grace Noon and her team who put together this video I'm gonna show you. And Grace, I'm wondering if you could just take a minute and talk a little bit about the development of this video and introduce the folks who helped put it together along with you. Want to put this video together so the communities and the families could see what is happening here every day and the dedication that we make. Take two, right? <laughs> so um, we, we really wanted to put this video together so the community and the families could see what happens here every day and the dedication that our maintenance and facility staff has. This is a sampling of what happens in each building every day. You may see what happens in one building and just because it's there doesn't mean it's not happening in all the school buildings. This is a sampling. And I really would like to thank all the head custodians and the entire custodial maintenance staff who they demonstrated and explained to me everything that they do. To Christian Giamarella who edited this piece together and it's many, many, many parts, I am truly grateful. And of course to Ed Keir who is the director of facilities. His passion and dedication to cleanliness and safety is par none. And I hope that you enjoy watching this and we'll learn a little bit about what's happening in your, your child's school.
So here's a basic setup that's in every room in the district. Box of disposable gloves, alcohol wipes for any device, computers, phones. We have surface wipes, disposable masks, and disinfectant spray. And all these supplies are refilled upon the teacher's request. Any area that is used for student arrival in the morning, like in here it's the cafeteria, when they go to their first class, custodians come in and they'll spray down with an electrostatic sprayer, all desks, chairs, door hardware, anything that's been touched, 
and then it is ready for the first cafeteria period. Well, the students come in, get their temperature checked, they go straight to their classrooms. Uh, once school is in fully, around nine o'clock, we'll go around and spray all the doors, all the main entrances, side doors, all the handles, railings, um, after that, around 10 o'clock, we will do a clean of all the bathrooms, uh, faculty bathrooms, student bathrooms, office bathrooms. Uh, we spray them down, uh, disinfect them all. Due to coronavirus, we, we had to find a new way to have lunch uh, because at lunchtime, of course, students and staff cannot wear a mask while you're eating, so we had to find a new way to do this. So in the high school and middle school, um, we have all the eating stations set up six, six feet apart, social distancing for everyone. And that in between every single um, sitting, the uh, custodial staff has to be there to clean and disinfect those spaces, both, both um, table and chair. In the elementary schools, the, the children are eating in the classrooms and they have a schedule set up there that after they eat, they go through and they clean and disinfect um, all the classrooms throughout the building. We believe that the cleaning to this year, you know, is very, very important, especially to the cleaning and the disinfection of all the classrooms and really the whole building. Every kid, every student, they have their lunch in the classrooms. So right after all this, they finish it, we get it here, do the cleaning and the disinfection, all the classrooms, the floor, the bathrooms, all the stuff. This is our Oxenbeer disinfectant. This um, helps us clean and disinfect the area. Our children eat in the classrooms for lunch and snack. So it has a one minute uh, dwell time. You can spray it and then after one minute you can go and wipe down and spray. And in case you do miss it, you can get away with not wiping it. But we always go back and wipe it um, like I said, this helps us save time during the day. It's a quick spray, but it also disinfects at the same time. At the end of the day, we clean, we clean first and then we disinfect. So sometimes they work together or sometimes they're separate. So basically, you know, we clean all the desks down, the chairs, the bathroom, sweep the room, reorganize it, strain it up. And then at the end, we'll disinfect everything. And then also we have another electronic uh, static sprayer that we use at the end of the day when the building's empty and we spray every room to disinfect completely. That goes for hallways, bathrooms in the hallways. We also have bathrooms in our classrooms that get done. Just to add some also information about what we do with the grounds of the school district. The, the grounds is a very important piece because it gets touched not only by our students and staff, but also by the public who comes to visit our buildings. The East Chester Facility Department purchased a hot water power washer this year to help us in preparation of disinfecting areas they handle the COVID-19 pandemic. The hot water power washer allows us to now disinfect and prepare areas like public bleachers, athletic areas, playgrounds, and benches throughout the district. After the areas are in hot water power washed and disinfected and cleaned, then custodial is able to come behind us and apply micro armor sealer, which now gives us anywhere from a six to 12 week coverage of not allowing any type of bacteria to adhere to any of these surfaces and this is a process that we've been doing on a monthly basis i hope you enjoyed this uh, video of how the o m department the custodial staff uh, and the maintenance department handles the um, safe and healthy environment here at the school district uh, in closing i'd just like to make sure you understand that not only do we clean and disinfect but we also um, have other means to provide a a safe and healthy environment with the use of filtration systems and all our powered ventilation. We use a MERV 13 filter throughout the school district in all powered ventilation. That's the, the highest level of filtration we can use to prevent virus spread throughout our buildings. So I thank you again for watching the video as uh, we strive here every day to protect the students and the staff and provide a healthy environment for them to learn in. Thank you.
operation is a maintenance team. Can you hear me? Is this okay? Good, thank you. So just, you know, just to say a couple of more words um, about our uh, maintenance and cleaning staff. Since the closing of schools last year, as essential workers, they were in the buildings, keeping them running when there was no other staff present, when there are no students present, they were still in the buildings, making sure the heating systems, the electrical systems, that everything was still up and running and that no issues were coming up when the buildings were technically closed. Over the summer, they reconfigured, reconfigured classroom space, developed new cleaning protocols that you saw in this video. They placed stickers and lines and barriers throughout the building. They were performing uh, maintenance on our ventilation systems. For the reopening, they will now be moving a lot of that furniture back into the classrooms in a, in a very short period of time. And as you can see, they clean endlessly to ensure the safety of the faculty, students, and staff. They have really gone above and beyond. Even um, as many of their staff members have been quarantined, they've been spread very thin, but they've always stepped up to the plate. They've done whatever we've asked them to do, whatever we needed them to do. And they've really been, um, they've really been true partners get, you know, in getting us through um, this pandemic. So I just wanted to um, read their names. A shout out, recognition. I want to start by thanking Ed Keir, the director of facilities, for overseeing all this. Ed really positioned us in a really good place even before the pandemic. He really helped improve the cleaning systems in the district, um, buying a lot of equipment that I think if, if we were caught by this pandemic five years ago, we would have been in a much different situation. So I felt like we were really much better prepared to handle this. And I thank Ed for that. I want to thank his assistant, Marina Franco, his office assistant. Um, she works very tirelessly to uh, make sure everything keeps moving. Um, so I want to start by um, at the Waverly School, our head, our head custodian, Tony Hansen, uh, Steve Cottrell, he's our interim head custodian there, Jonathan Anderson, Kevin Bariga, Angela Fernandez. At Ann Hutch, we have our head custodian, Joseph Piaquadio, Reynaldo Sabalas, Mohamed Patel, and Sylvia Valencia. At Greenvale, we have our head custodian, Enrique Tristan, Lucia Rodriguez, Anna Hernandez. At the middle school, our head custodian is Pete Trapani. Sorry. And our cleaners and custodial workers are Jose Barriga, Michael Carrillo, Carmine Gianelli, Herminio Romero, Cynthia Smiley. At the high school, our head custodian is Carmine Carlone. Our senior custodian is Steve Cottrell, if I mentioned him already. Um, our custodial workers are Joseph Filardi, Nathan Headlam, Hortensia Solano, Leroy Prescott, Holly Edwards, Katrina Jonai, Jason Kapicki. Our district-wide maintenance staff is our maintenance four-person, Eric Bomer. Tommy Cloyd, Anthony Hansen, Augie Nardone, Lansford Nelson, Angel Ramos, and Frank Stasola. And then we also have our sub cleaners who have been an integral part of the staff as well. Stephanie Balbin, Timothy Lewis, Elsa Aduato, and Jose Sagas de Zada. I think that's everyone. So again, I just wanted to thank everyone. We couldn't run this district without you. And uh, we just wanted to shout out and say thanks again. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to the entire team. That was um, recognition. Just going to share my screen again and move through a couple other points um, in terms of finishing up the report. So I want to talk a little bit about our efforts to return to more in-person learning. Thank you to all of our families who completed the week-long survey. We ask you to choose an instructional model. These are the latest data we have based on the survey that closed about uh, midnight last night. We have about an 80-20 split, roughly an 81-19% split on uh, individuals, families who 
chose for their students fully remote versus in-person. The in-person is about 81% um, and about 18, 19% and about 19% chose chose um, fully remote learning. Across the district, in terms of authorization for testing, for the rapid testing, uh, about 55% consented without parental consent, about 16.5% consented to testing with parental consent, and uh, about 28% did not consent to COVID-19 rapid testing to be done by the school district. In terms of transportation, if your child is, we asked the question, if your child is, is eligible for busing services, do you intend to have your child ride the bus? 21% uh, in the yellow are not eligible for busing, but of those who are, 46% uh, said that they would intend to have their children ride the bus, and 32.2% said they would not. We asked about food service, and if food service were to be restored for the remainder of the school year, would your child purchase lunch on a regular basis? 54% approximately said no, and about 45, 46% said yes. Uh, I do not believe that that distribution is necessarily even across, you know, each school district. We have to each school within the district. We have to look at that more deeply. But this is a district-wide um, number, so it, we'll start looking at that and deciding if we can do anything to restore food service. Some themes have emerged. These are just a few uh, things that we heard through all, all of, the, of the virtual sessions we conducted last week. We've got a. You know, we have a lot of questions about testing that we're digging into. We are finding that the implementation of a surveillance testing program at 20% per month is, is quite challenging. It's a big steep hill to climb. There are a lot of regulations we are now learning about as we go through this, but we continue to learn and see what we can, can do to move that forward and how we move that forward um, in the most expeditious way that we can. Uh, so we will continue to keep you posted on that. Uh, we heard from families that they were concerned about teacher changes. Of course, we know that if you're going from fully remote to in-person learning or you're moving from hybrid learning to fully remote, that you would have to undergo a teacher change to do that at the elementary level only. The secondary level, there would be no change to that. But those were things that concern families, understandably. We also had to prepare people for the fact that it may be there may be other teacher classroom assignment changes that might need to occur, but hopefully not. We're going to try to minimize those. There were a lot of questions throughout last week about, you know, how come we're moving off of two days? Why not five days? How will the streaming work? I think we cleared most of those questions up and arrived at the, uh, the four day a week model with the Wednesday, fifth day being virtual and uh, the streaming being, uh, you know, clarified at the elementary level and, and also at the secondary level. We had a, a number of questions and still have a number of questions that we need to communicate about re regarding detailed building procedures. People wanted to understand what's going on in the hallways at each school and at each level. And so we'll have more detail on that uh, probably next week as we give principals some time first to uh, decide which, if any classrooms need to be moved how we fit the people who've elected a program into the spaces that we have in a school. And once that's done, we'll be able to have a better handle on more specific building procedures that will be occurring. How we will work through hallways, how will recess work, how will arrival and dismissal work and all of that. We know that that's um, something people wanna know about, but we need a little more time to work through that. Um, we, we had questions about, will our fully remote students be participating in end of the year events and of course, Fully remote students, any events we may have, um, you know, our fully remote students are our students and we'll try to include them in every, in every way. Um, I do think that there are some lingering questions about what events we're going to run. And I wanna be clear that just because we're open for academics doesn't mean we're going to be open for everything. We need, we need next week uh, or the week after to try to decide what the new guidelines are for gathering and what events make sense to hold safely within schools. Some may work, some may be modified, some may not work. So I want to temper everybody's expectations that we, we're not going to run every event we've always run in a school necessarily um, at this point. We need some time to study each event and decide if it can run 
safely and effectively or if it can be modified. We heard from some families that they would like uh, the secondary plan to try to start sooner. So we're taking a look at that and we'll have more information coming soon. Uh, we had originally said that it might be fourth quarter before we can do that, but we're looking to see if we can do that closer to April 12th. So our next steps will involve using the survey data that we have to fit spaces and you know, classroom spaces to student class sizes. We'll determine our staffing, we'll order any remaining materials. We've had desks starting to arrive. We've had uh, polycarbonate shields starting to arrive. And so we're, we're in good shape with regard to all of that. Um, our testing protocols, as I mentioned earlier, still can, are gonna continue to need a lot of work over the next week or two. Uh, we may need to do some additional staffing. Uh, we're looking at procedural changes, of course, as I mentioned and physical plant changes are going to start to occur. So you may see desks and um, polycarbonate barriers coming into classrooms sooner rather than later because we need to do this across the whole district. And so just because the desks are there doesn't mean that they have to be used right now, but we need to start getting them into place and the operations and maintenance team will start to work on that. And all of this of course needs to be communicated you know, to our families so they know in advance what to expect. Right now, we're right on we're right on schedule with our timeline, and we are um, we're confident that we'll be able to have everything in place for our started our stated start date. I want to switch gears really quickly. This is the last thing that I want to speak about tonight in my report. I want to talk. I want to look to the future, and I just want to give everybody a preview. We started to, to talk about strategic planning here within the district um, over a year ago. And uh, it has been something that I, I, we've all felt as a board, as an administrative team, uh, that the, the district really could benefit from strategic planning. Um, but you know, life happens, and COVID happened, and uh, it, it really, you know, behooved us to take the strategic planning process that we had all set up for earlier and put it aside, uh, so that we could manage you know, the, the crisis that we're in the middle of, midst of right now with regard to the pandemic. But now that we're beginning to turn the corner, crest the hill uh, with regard to more in-person learning and what looks like it could be a more, more normal future in the fall and beyond, it's time to really start to look at strategic planning and what that's going to look like. So I want to go over the process that we're going to be using just in, in a, at a high level. So this process that we're gonna use is facilitated by a gentleman named Jonathan Costa, who really sets the gold standard for strategic planning in this region. He was interviewed by our board and by our administration, and we feel very confident that he does a terrific job. And we looked at his process and we were very impressed with it because it uses a data-based backward design. Uh, it focuses on leverage points that bring, you know, the highest level of improvement for student learning, for preparation in life, uh, and for success in the digital age. And it really looks at three different types areas with, within a school system. It looks, first of all, at student improvement or learning improvement. So the student data, right, that, that we all are familiar with that you want to use to drive your instructional practices and your decision-making, but it goes beyond that. And it talks, this process will also touch on professional improvement. What uh, adult data sets do we have within the school system that will help drive instructional improvement and decision making uh, around our instructional programs? And then building and district improvement as well. So other organizational data that we have in the district. And it's going to seek to align all of these things because one supports another. You can't have high levels of student achievement without these other two areas being in alignment, high levels of professional uh, improvement as well and building and district level improvement. So these things will integrate. And the process really has five basic phases. You make a commitment in the beginning where it's very philosophical. You start, you, you recommit to your mission, your vision, your values. Then you, you look at your internal and external data. Then you analyze that data for the third phase. You use that data then to identify gaps between where you are and where you want to be. And then you start to identify and strategize your action steps, and then you align um, those action steps into a plan with outcomes, timelines, and responsibilities. What I think is 
Very interesting as we've talked with uh, Jonathan Costa, who will again be facilitating this. Um, Mr. Wynn and I had extensive conversations with him about the effect of the pandemic in this process. When we first put the process together, we didn't we didn't know what the effect of the, the pandemic would be. But what uh, Mr. Costa has realized is that in districts where they've tried to engage this work at this time, uh, it was important to take some time and look at what has just been gone through. It's sort of a traumatic event, really. You have to kind of step back and look at it and say, well, what do we learn as a result of this process? And what, what kind of healing and reflection do we need to go through before we engage in you know, just plowing ahead with planning as though, as though we didn't learn anything or experience anything, right? We've learned and experienced a lot. We're not done yet with that. So I think that this is a nice addition into the process that, that is going to be made based on our, our experience. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna start here in April and it's not going to be completed until end of December, early January, but there are, uh, there's a very detailed timeline associated with it. And I'm just gonna walk you through some of those timeline components. The first phase is really just committing to the principles. So we're gonna convene a planning team. We've got our first meeting scheduled for about 20, 25 people who we're gonna to start to reaching out to. We haven't contacted them yet, but we've got you know an initial list of like, you know, 60% internal folks, about 40% community folks. And we're trying to hit all employee groups and have some involvement. This is really a steering committee or a team that will, that will assist with the planning. Um, the days of having, you know, 50 or 60 or 80 people come and be part of uh, all of the planning is, is not highly practical. This approach will use like 20, 25 people to steer the process and we will use tools to engage the entire community virtually and in other ways to make sure we get maximum input going forward. And so there will be a Kickstarter packet of, of materials about you know, what the future uh, requires, what the future will require of educational systems. We're gonna wanna get current on the research and the data and the latest thinking. Uh, then we're going to conduct community outreach through a series of thought exchanges. Uh, you may recall that in the beginning of the pandemic, we set out a thought exchange, which is a, a way where um, it asks some open-ended questions. And then the thought exchange software allows people in the community who are given the survey to provide actionable ideas. And then those ideas are uh, built upon sort of rated and ranked and, and voted on by others. And so the, the, the ideas that seem to get the most traction rise to the top. This is one tool that we will use in this process to try to get surface the community's best thinking. But this first phase is really about looking at our current district mission, vision, values, and asking ourselves, are these the right ones? Do we need to build on these? Do these need to be modified? Or do, these need, do we need to start completely over? So you're really looking at your mission, vision, values to start with. Second phase is to assign data collection groups. And these would be examples of data collection groups, your learning goals, your strategies for learning, your measures of learning, things like that. So that would be from August through October where this would be going on, where after the mission vision values are sort of reestablished and you know, come to the board for discussion and those look like they're shaping up and we are, there's a renewed commitment to those then you start to look at your data collection. Uh, so again, the thought exchange tool and other tools like it will be used. And we're looking at the current state, right? We wanna understand the current state of, of our own district. We're going to uh, consider the fact that we may need some other focus groups. Those are optional, but they can be held. When I say in person, they'll probably be held virtually, but the notion of focus groups is certainly an open opportunity if we want to do that. And then we want to make sure that Jonathan will make sure as he facilitates that each team is comfortable with the data um, that will inform, you know, the gaps that we see and help us set some priorities. The third and fourth phases will take place in November. And these are really just going through the goal and analyzing the goals and, and you know, setting priorities, so looking at the data and starting to look at what's high leverage, what's high impact. What can we actually sustain over time? Uh, how would we measure any movement forward? And then each 
uh, you know, what would what would success look like? What would that begin to look like? And then the last phase is to uh, really then turns uh, uh, more internal for the folks who work in the school system to take that information and start to build strategic priorities and action plans around it. So you're going to have outcomes, rationale, indicators of success. You're going to do some mapping. We're going to um, look at what resources and system implications we may have to try to get some of this done to make sure it's sustainable. And really, it's a, a tactical phase that we would look at so that you would be trying to look at a, an opportunity gap that you have and you want to try to close it in a year or a year and a half or two years time and have some contingencies built in so that we have an accountability component to this, right? That's built, that's built in. Then there'd be a final report. And I'm thinking that in January, we would be able to deliver that planning report to the community and uh, that we would have, you know, the a review and an endorsement done um, for the community. With that, I will stop sharing my screen. I will just say that I'm very excited and enthusiastic about it. I think this is gonna be a good process. This was just a high level. I think there will be some more components you know, added into it and it, we, you'll get a more customized look at it. But because we're gonna start at the end of next month, I figured you, know, you ought to have, the community ought to have an idea about this, where it's going and our high level of enthusiasm about it. This district will undoubtedly uh, benefit from having a, a very strategic focus for its work, to put the resources we have to the best use, put the dollars and the, and the people we have who are second to none, just amazing people we have in a position to, to, to move everything in, a, in one common direction around what's most important for our students here in East Chester. You know, you can pick a lot of things to do, a lot of good work that is done and can be done. But the benefit and the beauty of a process like this is it's you step back and ask the question, what's the most important, highest leverage, high yield thing that we can do for our students? And let's let's make sure we focus on that first and foremost. So that's that's good work. I mean, that's really good work, and I'm excited to get that started. So I'll leave. Uh, I'll I'll you know end there. I'm, I know we've taken a lot of time, but I hope that you found this informative, and I'm certainly happy to, to answer any questions that, um, that I can at this time, if you have them. Otherwise, it was just good for general awareness. So thank you, Dr. Glass. I, I know obviously that was something the board was very anxious to get going. And, and so we're glad to see it, it's finally starting uh, and that we're, we're starting to see it's something that we're capable of. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Dr. Glass? All right. In that case, I'm going to move on to the agenda and Steve, if I could, I guess we have to do the, well, I guess you want to do five through, you want to do five through nine? Um, is it uh, six? Can we open a public hearing? I don't know how we. Yes, a public hearing is an opportunity for anyone in the community or in some sort of public comment room here who would like to comment on that item, which has been posted on the community's website, and we should always be careful about the uh, emergency management plan that we have. We added a small component that deals with uh, what you do in the pandemic. Up for review. And any comments can be taken online. They can also be taken tonight as part of a formal public. Public hearing. Yep. I'll move to open the public hearing uh, on the, uh, the district wide safety and emergency management plan. Uh, which is prior to the scheduled adoption on March 23rd, 2021. And Tara, can I get a second? I second. Okay. Does anybody here from the public wish to comment on the plan? Seeing none, uh, anybody I guess online can put it into chat. And 
Uh, Steve, can I get a motion to close the public hearing? Yep, motion to close the public hearing. All right, Tara, can I get a second? second. All right, the public hearing, uh, all in favor? All right, the public hearing is now closed. And Okay. I move that we approve the uh, the minutes for February twenty third, twenty twenty one Board of Education meeting. Uh, be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education approves the personnel agenda as attached. Uh, be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the placements as recommended by the Committee on Preschool Special Education and the Committee on Special Education. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the budget transfers of over $10,000 for the month of February, 2021. Be it resolved that the Board of Education accepts the following warrants as attached. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the following health services con uh, contracts as listed. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the student activity reports for the East Chester High School and East Chester Middle School from October 2020 through December of 2020. Be it resolved that the Board of Education approves the disposal of the following equipment and vehicle as listed. And be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the agreement with Tuckahoe Youth Association, East Chester Little League, and the Marone Landscaping Inc. for the improvement of baseball and softball infields at East Chester High School. All right, Tara, can I get a second? A second. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, then all in favor? All right. And uh, Vito, do you want to do 10? 10 is, this, okay, I, I, hold on, do I have to do this? Yes. Uh, I'd like to move uh, 10.1, New York State Public Education Funding Resolution, and 10.2, the approval of the 21-22 school calendar. And Aaron, can I get a second? All right, any questions or comments? Go ahead, Vito. Uh, I'd like to take a look at that and, and discuss the uh, funding resolution a little bit because I read through it. It's rather long and everybody knows I made a passionate plea at our last meeting about a big piece of this. And what I'd like to do is, in my opinion, this funding resolution is way too long and way too convoluted. And I'd like to split it into two resolutions. And I'd like to have a very definitive resolution that says, you stole our money, we want it back. Not in those words, but that is the reality of it. New York State has taken money that was given to us by Congress and not passed it along to us. So I'd like one resolution to deal only with that, and then we can talk about the other resolution as a standalone. Well, can I make this suggestion, if it's okay with you? Why don't we vote on this one? And we can certainly do a second one with the, in line with what you're saying. I don't have a problem with that, but... Uh, I mean, that would be, I don't disagree with you that what happened is exactly what you said it is. I'm not disputing the point at all. I don't disagree. Uh, if you had a resolution to put before me today, I'd be prepared to, to have that go forward. But well, since we have something in front of us, I'd rather vote on that. And, and that doesn't preclude us from doing yours as well. I, I appreciate that. But the whole idea is this is very long, very convoluted. And it's throwing so much against the wall, trying to get something to stick that in my opinion, it has very little weight. So I think the real important thing is we need our $300,000. You know, throwing things in here that, we, that have no chance of, of a snowball's chance in hell of passing, just watered down the other one. And uh, honestly, I would vote against this as it stands right now. I don't agree with, with uh, several of the items that are included in it. Uh, and so, you know, and I don't want to vote against what I want to vote for, if you know what I'm saying. 
That's that's why I'm proposing to break it into two. So if you if you want to call a vote on, you know, I'd like to hear other people's opinions. Uh, you know, I think we definitely need a strong statement on the money that's our money, and the other stuff we could talk about. You know, if people agree with it or disagree with it, maybe other people disagree with a couple of lines in here as well. I don't know. So. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I'll, I'll put your motion to a vote. I have no problem doing that. I, I would just say that I know certainly many of these things were things that uh, Shelley Mayer and Amy Cohen talked about in terms of the legislation they're trying to do and that were raised with them. Uh, and so I certainly think and that, and while that, some of it may not pass, I don't necessarily disagree. These are things that they're at least trying to work on. And they certainly are aware of the issue of the fact that we have not gotten the money from the, from the feds that went to the state and hasn't made its way to us. Quite honestly, that, that shouldn't even be a resolution. I mean, people should not have to advocate for money that's already been given to us. And, and they were aware of that. That's <laughs> ridiculous. And, and it's, it's, it's copping out on the issues by throwing all this other stuff in there. Let's just go after the money that we need that is our money, okay? And then we could talk about the other stuff. A lot of these other things make sense. Several of them I personally disapprove of, but I'd say the majority of them I approve. And, and I'd be willing to talk about the other ones in another resolution. Okay. I'm no. sorry. Well, I'll put your motion to a vote in a second. Cheryl, you had something? Uh, yeah, hang on. Um, I am in a... I, I am in agreement with this resolution as stated. I understand uh, Vito's resolution, um, reservations about it. Um, but I think that this resolution addresses the issue of supplanting funds. Unfortunately, the first two um, bills that went through the first CARES Act and the second do allow, legally allow for the governor to do what he's done. So it is hyperbolic to call it stealing. And I'm not saying that it's wrong, but this, this specifically says, um, whereas federal funds intended to aid schools in managing pandemic costs in the CARES Act was used to fully supplant state aid funds in the 2020-2021 school year. That was done and it was part of the bill. It was allowed to be done. And the, here the resolution says, be it resolved that the district calls on state legislators to reject the executive budget proposal to fully supplant state aid with the uh, CARES Act federal funds. So I think it's doing the work it needs to do by addressing the fact that what the governor has done is was done legally, although certainly is not ethical or appropriate. And we, I, I uh, you know, agree with this statement that we're taking a stance against it. So I would be in support of this resolution. So I think we have a time constraint consideration here as well, right? I mean, the budget from the state is supposed to be coming out April uh, 1st, right? So I would, I would recommend, you know, and I hear what you're saying, Vito, about the fact that by sort of throwing everything in the pile, we may not be getting the things that might be achievable. But I think we actually are doing this in some sense to direct response to, you know, a, a sort of a, a request, for lack of a better word, or conversation with Shelley Mayer and Amy Pollan that they, you know, if they have school districts, you know, passing resolutions to support them, they can go back to the, the state for the budget. So my recommendation is, is we probably should, you know, vote on this tonight as is, and then maybe next meeting, if you have other language that you want to break it out, we could make a new resolution that's, you know, that, that meets your goals next, next meeting. Because I don't want to hold up two weeks of, you know, not having it and then find out we missed the boat. I, I would just, I'd use the same language and just take a couple of lines out and split it into two documents. That's all I'm proposing. Steve? So that actually is what my question is, is if there's just one or two lines that you'd want to remove, what would those lines be? And then maybe if the group decides that if we remove one or two lines and then pass it and everybody's... No, what... what what, so I'm what, saying, would you take out? what I'm saying is I would take uh, let's see, one, two, three, the fourth one, the fifth line, and the sixth line, whereas federal funds, where is the executive budget, and where is the executive budget, I'd put them in a separate resolution and, and vote on them as is, because that's the bulk of the federal money that was allocated that was not provided to us, okay? 
So you want? So to I would just take statements, or, 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 or yeah, I would take those three out and, and make us make them into have an A resolution and a B resolution. That's that's where I'm coming from. I really support that, and and I I think that I think it needs to stand alone to show how important it is. When you put it in here with things like, uh, you know, the foundation aid. I mean, we've been talking about foundation aid for years. Let's not kid ourselves. Foundation aid is not going to happen. Okay, it should not, they're not going to go back and give us money for the last 10 years when they're $12 billion in the hole. So kind of alluding a, a, a something with a request like that, to me, takes away from the issue at hand. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's why, you know, that other stuff, if we want to ask for that foundation ad, fine, okay? But it takes away from the importance of the real money that's out there. That's, I, that's why I'm, I'm hang suggesting on, I'll, I'll come back to you, I promise. Tara? I just had a quick couple of comments. I mean, I understand where Vito's coming from and um, I'm definitely in, in agreement with Cheryl. I know we have a very limited time for us to vote on this, but um, can we consider voting on this tonight? And if we decide to do a, dis a discussion, an addendum can be also included with this. I mean, is that a possibility? I'd like to see this go through though. I mean, I know this is, I mean, we have very, very limited time. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that, but I, there's certainly nothing that would prevent us from doing a different resolution as well on the okay. 23rd, but at least this way, the legislators would have this in front of them as an ask uh, before they start to get into real serious discussions too, too, too long from now. Because uh, I know those discussions are obviously ongoing every day at this point. Then I agree. And I think, you know, I, I, I respect Vito's views and opinions, but I'd like to, if we can, do a vote for this and, and for it to move forward. Okay. Carol? Um, I think that also, I, I, I also understand, you know, you don't want to muddy the waters and yet foundation aid, what's, what, the, what this uh, resolution seems to be primarily saying is that foundation aid is broken. Um, it has a couple of whereas, whereas is saying that the foundation aid formula is broken. I don't think it's it's not calling for funding from the past 10 years of being underfunded. It's calling for that to be fully funded. And it, I think it is actually important with foundation aid. I totally agree. You know, we're not going to be getting the money that we've been owed over all the years, but I think it's an important, it's important as a community that we are continuing to say as a school community and a town that this formula is broken and it's 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 unconscionable that this is continuing as the school aid formula and that we are continue it's demoralizing that we continue to see that underfunded number and it's a broken system and it must be fixed and i actually think it's important to keep it on the resolution it that the wrongness and the wrong headedness of foundation aid does not go away because of the money that the state is supplanting when it comes to the cares act and the other um the other acts that have been passed by Congress and the one that is going through Senate now. Dave? Yeah, um, I, I think I, I think that um, the reason I would vote on this is that it's, it's really an alarming framework that we are dealing with. Uh, we must be here. Here. Yeah, I, I, I would vote on this because I just think it's a framework for lobbying that we heard from Shelley Meyer and Amy Paul. And I think, Vito, your issues should come up more in, in, um, in, the, um, in our advocacy meetings. And we have to make sure that our legislators get hear from our community that this is hurting us terribly. I, I couldn't agree more, and they would have if I was at the meeting. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, they, they, they were aware that Eastchester was one of the lowest funded districts in, in, certainly in the county, but even in the state, in terms of our percentage, we were at like 40% or 43%. I mean, it, she, it was, it's appalling at how low a percentage of foundation aid. And I agree, I'd love to get the money for the past 10 years, but I'll take 100% starting tomorrow and, and be happy with that. But, right? We're never going to get there, and I understand that. I agree, but, but, 
to Cheryl's point here on, on the back, oh, the back page for me, I printed the whole thing. We're asking for the full funding of the foundation aid. For this year. But it doesn't say that. Full funding means how much you, they're out, you're owed. That's full funding. I, it's going I, I can read English. That's what it says. You're asking for the full funding of the foundation aid. Okay? It doesn't say going forward. It, that's what it says. And if you want to argue that one in court, that's what makes lawyers rich. Okay? If you're talking about going forward, you should say going forward. If you're talking about going backwards, you should say going backwards. You well, can't leave it vague. I don't think we should give up the ask we're asking, right? There's another important point, right? Which is our foundation aid, regardless of regardless of what's owed in the past, our foundation aid hasn't increased in three years. So even though the formula That's says- That's true, I, I, right. I agree with those things. I'm not, I'm not saying eliminate that stuff. So, so, I mean, we can go and write a resolution that goes through every detail of which part we like and which part we don't like. And it's gonna be all the parts we don't like because I don't think there's really any parts we like about foundation right, right now because we're not getting what we're supposed to be getting. But I, I, don't, think that, that, I don't think that's better. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna lose out on the things that are the priority just because we're including stuff that may not be what we think is the priority. But you know, if you had language, you said, okay, here's what exactly the language I want to motion. I'd say, okay, I can hear that. But I have it. It's these three lines right here. Well, I can't see the three lines. <laughs> Did you print it? Could No, and I can't do it on the computer without sharing it on the screen. So I, I, I'm sort of at a well, disadvantage. Well, the resolution's here. not a secret. You know, I'll read them, okay? Where is federal funding intended to aid schools in managing pandemic costs in the CARES Act was used to fully supplant state aid funds in the 2021 school year? Whereas the executive budget proposes to use the Federal Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act funds intended for school pandemic expenses to replace 1.35 billion in state aid in the 21-22 school year. Whereas the executive budget proposes to fully use our district's CRRSA allocation in lieu of state aid for the 21-22 school year. That's it. That's what I'm saying needs its own resolution. And, and that's, to me, that's a powerful statement. You're telling them, give us the money that Congress voted to us. By including it in 25 things that are a wish list here, you're watering it down. And, you know, maybe the, the legislators want it watered down so that they could deal in a watered down environment. But I want to punch in the nose. I want to say, this is what we want. Oh, oh. This is important to us. So I'm going to try and follow the training that Dr. Urso gives her people and say that both sides can be true. And so therefore, maybe what we can do is we can do this resolution and do a, a second resolution with just those items as well that Vito wants. How is that for a suggestion? So we'll pass two resolutions tonight, one with all of it and one with just his. And that way they'll have two resolutions. I don't see the harm to that unless anybody disagrees. Yes, Vito. I would take them out. It, just separate the same thing into two. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I understand, but I, they're going to get one separate with just the language that you're talking about. Doesn't that achieve the purpose you wanted? And if, if yeah. I may? Yeah, yeah. The, I'm, I'm the, the very last line of the entire resolution, I absolutely completely do not agree with. And feel free to disagree, but it's asking for the tax levy to be raised to 2% this year, which is changing the law, okay? It says, the East Chester right. Union Free School District calls on the legislators to set the allowable growth factor in the tax levy calculation for the coming year at 2%. Okay. Right now it's set at 1.29, whatever it is, okay? That's a significant increase in taxes because by raising it to 2%, right now at 1.27, we're looking at a 2% tax increase. By raising it a full point, we'd be looking at a 3% real estate tax increase. I, I cannot support that. I so, mean, that so, last so, line- so, 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 but, but understanding that, then you can't, if that line stays in there, no matter what the resolution is, you're not gonna support it. That's so correct. why am I amending the resolution if you're not gonna support it anyway? No, I would support the one with the other three pieces. So I said, so we'll do a second resolution with just that part. We'll do this main resolution as well. And that way you can get what you would vote for. You have the resolution you're voting against and that achieves both ends. 
That works for me. I would like everyone else's opinion if they would support a 2% tax cap this year instead of the 1.26. Okay. Changing the existing law. That's what you're asking them to do. Okay. So if you want us, we I can mean, each individually comment on that. I don't have I don't have a problem with that. Under these circumstances, given the pandemic and the additional costs that we are have incurred and will incur, even though Lisa's done a great job in terms of accomplishing savings that are going to accomplish that, given what we don't know for the upcoming year, I personally would not have a problem with increasing the tax cap to two percent for this particular year alone. Not going forward. I personally, I abhor the whole tax cap, but that's a separate discussion for another time. But under these circumstances, my personal opinion, it's just mine, you're asking me, as well as everybody else, my opinion is for this one year, I wouldn't have a problem with, with in essence, an exemption from the law for everybody to go up to 2%. That's just my opinion. I will let anybody else who wants to comment, comment. Um, I, I, speaking for myself, I think to to make tax cap tie into two percent or or the inflation rate or whatever is less is bogus anyway because the inflation rate really doesn't measure our any school expenses that well. I personally think the tax cap should just be at two percent continually, but that's just my opinion. No. I'm not opposed to the two percent for the one, you know, for this one year in extenuating circumstances. But I think we've Lisa's presentations have more than shown that it's needed. Um, I, I am also not opposed to including the a separate resolution for veto. But I like the language as a whole. For the first. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the tax, the 2% is an, an arbitrary number, right? So um, I, I understand Vito's reservations, which is basically once we've set that limit, uh, you know, the, the, the concept and the history is, is that if the limit is 2%, you're going to get 2%. If the limit's 1.5, you're going to ask for 1.5. That's, that's historically what, we, what we've seen. Um, on the other hand, you know, I agree with what Rob's saying. This this year we're going to be dealing with. You know, we don't necessarily have to ask for two percent, and if the public doesn't agree with it, it won't pass. I mean, prior to the tax cap, we didn't pass a budget every year. We didn't pass bonds every year. So, you know, it's 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 a question for the public. And and at the same time, if we're going to find ourselves having to lose out on programs or lose out on, you know, staffing and, and other things, I'd rather I'd rather go over the the, the minimum if we have to. So that's my comment. Can I just ask one question? Sure. My understanding is that if you were to change, if you wanted to override the 2% tax cap, you had to have a vote of the community, correct? But this resolution is asking for the, for the government to give us this one year exemption. So we wouldn't have to have the vote of the community. No, sure. that's, what, a, that's incorrect. You, you need a super majority. No, you need, I think it's a 60% majority vote to overturn, to override the tax cap. That's correct, but, but what her question was is incorrect. No, the resolution calls for the legislature to basically exempt everybody from the 2% cap this year. No, but what the, what the resolution the calls vote. for is to disregard the inflation number and use the 2% cap instead of the inflation number, okay. which is only one and a quarter. That's what the resolution right. is asking. So it, tells, it, it asks the, the legislature to set the rate this year artificially at 2% as opposed to the inflation right. rate. And right now, our, our preliminary budgets that we're looking at right now have a 2% increase in them, okay? The tax based on the 1.26, because of all the other gyrations and the formulas and stuff, it turns out that we're at 2%. By raising it to 2%, that number is now gonna go to 3%. Right, it goes up 0.8% or whatever it is. It'll go up 3%, believe No, me. no, I understand. It ought to go up to 0.8% because you're going from 1.2 to 2. I, I don't I understand your point. I, I and I don't disagree with you. I'm not yeah. saying your analysis is wrong. Uh, I just think under the circumstances, again, just my opinion. All right, so let's let's can I call a motion? Let's call the main motion and then I'll call Vito's motion to do a second resolution with his separate whereas clause. So uh, let's call the uh, roll on the 
motion as written in the agenda tonight. All in favor. All right. So, and, and against? Seven to one. Okay. All right. And now a motion, Vito, you, your motion is for the separate, the three whereas clauses that you read. Yeah, and there might be a fourth one in here that deals with the same issue. I'm not really sure because I kind of did this, you know. Well, I need to know what I the didn't do this is. as a lawyer. <laughs> but don't we need an actual resolution though, right? The yeah. whereas is you have the resolution. You just delete everything. So you're that, saying delete delete everything. Delete everything that's not about the COVID so federal want, COVID relief. So you want to keep okay because everything cause that's COVID relief stays in. That's what I'm saying. But it's not just the whereas is it's the resolutions or the therefores. Yeah. Right, right. Be it resolved. Including right, the one that point, including the one that you objected to, which is the last line, right? No, you're going to be it resolved that we're asking for the federal funds to be reinstated. Right, but you can't move. You can't move a concept. You have to move language. So, what, what, you you want to remove the last resolution, right? The last line. What about the line before that? You want, you want me to rewrite this thing right now? Well, no. Well, that's what I'm saying. Why don't you rewrite it <laughs> and then that's we'll vote on it on the twenty third? That next would be week. my point. Ah, uh, we could do that. Okay, let's we do, that. do that. All right. But the All concept right. is just to keep the CARES Act stuff. That's fine. All write, by itself. Write it, whatever you want, for the and give it to us in advance of the 23rd right. so we can look at it and, and put it on the agenda. Okay. So, uh, and then uh, approval of the 2020-21-22 calendar. Yes. Um, a question about the calendar. It looks like there are five... Um, professional development days in the calendar. And usually I think we have four, just was curious about that. You are correct. There are five days next year. You also notice that um, next year we will be observing uh, an extra day in June as day off June 2 uh, will be observed on June 20th. Um, so in order to make 286 days uh, required for staff, we had to add a, another day that wasn't taking away from a student day. So we added a professional development day at the beginning of the year. I think I'm still unmuted, hang on. Okay, um, so you'll have a, a fun three days together. A lot, to, a lot, you'll get a lot accomplished and I hope everyone um, has a nice time and can get back together face to face. Absolutely. You have a nice lunch or something. Mm -hmm. A question on calendar? Sure, Vito, uh, go ahead. I did review the calendar, but I didn't look at the distance scale. Are we still going to have snow days next year? Or we just, why don't we just eliminate snow days and go to remote learning days? If it snows, kids are home, they get assignments. Snow days are a negotiated item, so we'd have to enter into negotiations. You negotiate with the weatherman if it snows? Or I don't understand your comment. Well, if we decide not to call a snow day, that's not a negotiation. It would only be if the governor is still allowing snow day, uh, allowing remote learning as a as a counted day, and we would then be requiring staff to come to the buildings in a snowstorm. So we have to do remote learning remotely. Well, again, that would have to be, we'd be negotiating that. Okay. Okay. So that could be something if the board wishes to that for us to enter into negotiations on that, I've we can. Where, I've read articles where snow days are, you know, basically a thing of the past at this point, because that's what we wanted them last year. If we wouldn't be, you know, not us particular, but in general, the snow day should be going the way it went. Because if you could, re, if you could learn remotely, because it's fun to sit home and make snowmen and go yeah, sledding. It's fun. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think snow days are, are everything that we've learned from this year. I hope we do carry a lot of it forward in terms of virtual meetings and other ways that we can use digital technology. But I personally think the snow days couple of year there were probably a highlights of some of kids years uh year this year and there's still um a big sigh of relief and a nice breather and uh something that children and probably teachers across the district look forward to so i would um 
they're also, I mean, they're, they are same. built into our calendar. Um, they're designed, we've designed the calendar to account for them. And I think we also need to take into account what, um, that our teachers are home, most likely their districts are on snow days and their children are home. What would that remote learning look like? Oh, I don't know. You know, in that you know, kind of setting, so. We'll, we'll sure. so. So I think as we do a post-mortem, yeah. once we get beyond COVID and as Dr. Glass said, is even part of the strategic planning, where we get to look back and see what did we learn from this? What can we do better? What can we do different? We should, we should be maybe that is that. very much something that we can look at among other things, right? I mean, maybe something as simple as keeping streaming if the governor allows it just for kids who are out long-term sick with the flu or something like that. Maybe that's a reason to keep it. Maybe it's not. That's a discussion for another day. Once we get beyond the pandemic itself, we can have those discussions and see what we learn. I absolutely agree. I think we should have those conversations and I agree with you. I just don't know that now is the time for that because we're still we're still in it and I don't think we should be writing a book about how we got beyond it while we're still in the middle of it. I just had a quick comment. Um, I absolutely agree that snow days should be built into the calendar. You have no idea what you know our weather's going to be like and 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 Cheryl brought up a good point. Just even basic stuff building a snowman. It's something that our children have to look forward to and you know I can only go by even just in particular my son's teacher when there's been a big you know snowstorm that they think they're gonna get we're gonna get like a foot of snow she's taken a vote with the students would you like me to like post work on the board for you guys to for you guys to do so I think each teacher has a different approach um, but I do think without a doubt um, just for you know, some regrouping for our teachers and of course for our students, snow days should be left in the calendar. I understand that everything is up for negotiation, but I don't think it's such a bad thing to have a couple of snow days listed in the calendar for everyone. Well, and for now that's not really the vote before us, but I agree with you. I mean, this is just approving the general calendar and we can always, if we want to negotiate it and change it, we always could. So, sure, and then I'll call on Judy. I want to apologize because I used the term snowman, and that might have offended some people. So I will correct it to snow person, okay? Just for those who may be offended. There you go. Judah? I, I, I hate to harp on the snow thing, but um, one of the things that I brought up in the last couple of years is the language for the two snow days that is a little bit, uh, what's the word? I don't know, confusing. A lot of parents get confused about the Memorial Day snow days that are give back days. And then as opposed to like, if the third snow day happens, it just takes away from, uh, you know, February break or April break, I forget which comes first. So um, I think you worked on that. It looks like there's some changes there. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I didn't get a chance to microanalyze it. Um, on the other hand, maybe there is premise and not to harp on this concept, maybe there, like this year, we, we had the two emergency days, uh, by the way, they're not just for snow, they're for emergencies. Um, but I know that it is also disruptive for, for, for teachers as well as families to deal with vacations, having to adjust vacation plans when you get to that third day. So maybe there is, you know, maybe there is a balance here. So I'll just throw that out there. When we get to the point where we're discussing this and negotiating this, balance is key. <laughs> and we, we have tried to work on the language to make it a little clearer. And I just <laughs> want to be clear that as of this year, we have only used technically one of our emergency closures. Yes, we were closed twice, but the second one, we it was a declared state of emergency, which means that we do not have to count that as a snow day. So as of right now, we will be in school on that Thursday before Memorial Day, but as of right now, we are still closed on the Friday before Memorial Day. <laughs> and we will be sending out a message just clarifying that for, for families. <laughs> Therein lies the confusion. <laughs> <laughs> just like a quick right. final, just one quick final yep. note about that. It's still at the bottom of the the, the, the one page or it still says that there are four superintendent conference days. So if, I didn't, if you're going to keep five, just update that. I'll take that tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that amendment, <laughs> uh, uh, any other comments? All right. Can I get a motion? All in favor? All right. Thank you. And hang on, now I got to get back to the agenda. 
Okay, so the future meeting dates is March 23rd, April 6th, and April 20th. And uh, I did not prepare a written statement. We're now going to open it up to comments from the public. I would just ask, there's not a big crowd here tonight, but we will also be calling on people from uh, online. If you could just try and keep your comments as a matter, as a matter of courtesy to three minutes. I've never stopped anybody at exactly three minutes, and I don't intend to do so tonight. But I would just ask that you keep your comments close to three minutes. And if you go way over, I will ask you to please try to wrap it up. Thank you. Before you start, we're going to do anybody that's here that wants to speak first, and then we'll go to the people online. Good evening, uh, Susan Dean, 32 Downer Avenue. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the PTA Council. I'm one of the PTA Council presidents, and I wanted to share with the board and the community. I wanted to share with the board and the community that the um, New York State PTA had a legislative summit two weeks ago in which the New York State PTA came together and discussed um, areas of policy and advocacy for the state this year. And then we followed that with a meeting this morning with Senator Shelley Mayer. And there was a lot of discussion at the board um, uh, about some of the things that we actually talked about with Shelley this morning. So I wanted to provide an update to the board and the community about some of these things, speaking on behalf of the New York State PTA and their policy and advocacy on four specific topics. The first one um, is probably the most popular one, which is school aid budget. The budget is due on the 31st. We'll be getting the governor's budget on the 1st. Shelly did share with us that she is rejecting the services aid. She is rejecting the STAR, um, and which is all things that the PTA, um, the New York State PTA has been advocating for. She's also proposed a bill that is going to um, work to increase the ability for the district to have larger fund balance in public schools, which will um, help with spending for what we hope to get from the CARES Act, but then also the money that we're gonna get from the American um, Rescue Act, which uh, is the bill that's going through the state now. She said that um, the federal money coming to Eastchester will be known, but I guess we don't know how much that, that money is yet. Um, the second area that we, um, we advocated for was mental health funding. Unfortunately, mental health funding in schools seems to be the first thing cut from budget. Um, we are asking as a New York State PTA that mental health funding specifically within the COVID recovery, there is a line item specific for mental health funding with COVID recovery in the American Rescue Act funding that just is going through now um, be um, allocated to the districts as it is stated and not be cut um, through um, the governor's redirection of money. The third thing was digital equity. So um, we, uh, we advocated this morning with her around digital equity. Um, Senator Mayer is a huge proponent of this and is actually put together a bill, it's S3184, which states that digital equity is a constitutional obligation um, by uh, the um, legislator to provide equitable an equitable environment for all students to be provided with um, bandwidth and technology. Um, and we saw that so apparent this year. Um, and so that was the third area that we advocated for. And the fourth one, was the legalization of recreational marijuana um, to say no to legalizing recreational marijuana. Um, we shared with her the proven effects, the detrimental effects on um, brains and lungs of small children, um, getting re recreational marijuana into their hands would just be devastating. Um, the revenue that the governor has um, proposed um, in, in getting mar recreational marijuana um, is actually very small. And so we advocated against it. It seems like 
Shelly has told us that this is going, something that is going to go through. And so I think it's something for our district to be aware of and to consider um, things like um, advocating for proper labeling of these items um, and, 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 the, and other um, areas like that. Also, um, increasing the, um, the uh, consequences of people that may sell these items to um, underage children. So I wanted to bring these areas up to the board because these are things that the New York State PTA has advocated for. And then um, I secondly wanted to put on another hat from the PTA Council and share that we have a uh, social emotional webinar coming up on April 7th. At 7.30, we're gonna be hosting a webinar in collaboration with SEPTA. And the content is uh, going to be on um, uh, around stress and anxiety with parents. Um, so managing anxiety um, and stress uh, for parents. So we will be sharing information on that. It's going to be April 7th at, um, at 7.30 and a sign up webinar link will be, um, will be sent shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, seeing nobody here, I'm gonna hang on. Oh, you wanna, you wanna, sure, go ahead. I just wanted to, um, to thank Susan. There was a lot of thought that was put into your, your whole commentary. And I'm um, in particular, um, you know, I'm very excited about this webinar that's going to be coming into place because I think the whole community can really benefit on viewing something like that. So, so thank you very much, Susan, and to the whole PTA council that is involved with this. All right, and Judah, do you want to see if we have anybody? I don't see anybody that's raised their hand, but if you're online and you wish to speak to us, you please raise your hand so that we can call on you. I don't see any hands raised. I don't see any either. I'll give them a second or two. And then I will go to comments from the board. I'm going to close the public comments and comments from the board. Sure, Steve. I, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for that video today um, about our custodial staff. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about it after our last meeting. We're often thanking teachers for the amazing job that they're doing, but we, we have such a diverse staff here um, beyond teachers, monitors, our technology staff, our custodians, just so many different um, staff members here and and they all play such a vital role in this district so thank you very much for that because we need to remember to thank all of our staff members all of the time for the amazing things that they're doing for for this district very well said all right anybody else Aaron? I, I don't want to harp on the snow days because they were fabulous, the few that we had. But um, I just, because Coach Johnson is here, the snow um, put a big damper on the winter track season this year because it was not indoor track, it was outdoor track. And it snowed exactly when the season was and we were unable to use the track a lot of the time. But Coach Johnson was amazing. He had indoor gym practices, um, parking lot practices. And on the very last day of the season, the 26th or whatever, February, on Friday, he was able to pull off a COVID championship with um, Byram Hills and Pelham and parents, two parents or two spectators per athlete were able to come. So that was like huge. First time I saw my kids compete this year. So I was really happy. And it was, it was so great to see. The kids were so excited. It was awesome. Not quite the um, armory, but <laughs> we'll take it. And um, two other thank yous I wanna say that um, uh, Dr. Glass touched on some creative outlets that we had in the district. Um, uh, Mrs. Leone organized Jazz Co for the middle school students. So high school students are in my house twice a week and my middle school student is dancing to Beyonce, which is really fun. And Mr. Zante, who is amazing, the band teacher, um, organized a uh, ja uh, jazz band club and it was so hugely received so he had to divide it into two bands. So I have a trumpet playing very loudly. I'm surprised Rob doesn't hear her at the end of Scarsdale Avenue. <laughs> um, but 
these teachers, not only do they do a great job during the day, they go above and beyond for all these activities to keep the kids engaged outside of the classroom. That's it. Anybody else? Tara? I just wanted to say lastly, again, um, thank you so much for administration, all our, our educators. Um, I, I can't believe the unbelievable job that they're, they're doing. It's absolutely incredible. And I was equally touched um, by the video regarding the custodial staff because sometimes they are under noted, you know, not as recognized. And um, I just, I really thank them from the bottom of our heart, of my heart, and I'm sure others that, you know, all their hard work is, is seen and is enabling our children to go to school. And so I, I think, I thank them very much. Anybody else? All right, can I get a motion to adjourn into executive session? Um, so you, were you voting or you, or you want to? Oh. What's the, what's the, All right, what's, second. What's the uh, purpose of the exec? Uh, is it, okay. All right. Gotcha. Very good. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Have a good night and be safe. Yes. Yes.